Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast. We are your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. Uh, let's see, before we get into the show proper, may as well do the usual shtick here. Please do interact with the product a little bit. Uh, any kind of subscriptions, liking, star ratings, written reviews, uh, comments, if that's at all applicable, anything that you can do to help the show out in that respect helps a lot, all of it. Uh, we, I mentioned we had a pretty big uh, growth spurt, actually, for uh, at the end of 2021, and we're not, I don't, I don't go into this a whole lot, but we're kind of, main, we're maintaining that uh, kind of a new average at the moment, so I thank you all a whole lot, so anything you can do to help out. If you've done all the other stuff already, please share, uh, be that in person or on your social media platform of choice. Let people know that you enjoy the show. That helps a lot. All right, on the agenda this evening, last night, UFC on ESPN plus 58, or you, uh, could also have been also known as UFC Vegas 47, I think it was, or UFC Fight Night 200. Uh, we'll go over the results from that particular card, the good, the bad, the otherwise. And this coming Saturday, ooh, baby, UFC 271. It's not a great card, <laughs> but your main event is a phenomenal, phenomenal fight. I can't wait. So we'll get a preview of that, and then, eh, whatever news came out over the week, and there was some. Some of it I don't care about. Some of it you might, so we'll just see how that shakes out. All right, with that out of the way, let's... Jump right in to our first topic. UFC on ESPN plus 58. Main event, Sean Strickland defeated Jack Hermanson via split decision. There were two 49-46s for Strickland and one 48-47 for Hermanson. Okay, before I talk about the fight proper, before I talk about the things I liked, etc., etc., that 48-47 for Jack Hermanson is insane. That is utterly indefensible. That particular scorecard was turned in by someone who I have called out on this program more than once. The uh, semi-sentient can of soup that is Saul D'Amato. Scored rounds 1, 3, and 5 for Hermanson, and I... Uh, look, I think Derek Cleary, um, who was one of the other judges who went 49-46 for Strickland, gave Hermanson the third as well, and uh, that blows my mind. Um, I, From where I was sitting, and needs to be said the following, watching fights live and in person is not the same as watching them at home on a TV screen. Um, it, it, it's just not the same. So I will be willing to grant that there, that the third round might have been, might have appeared closer in person than it did to me sitting at home, watching it on a monitor, you know, with headphones and whatnot. So I will potentially make that allowance. That said, from where I was sitting... Rounds two, three, and four were easily Strickland rounds. Easily. Round one was pretty close. It was competitive. It was the one where um, I think Hermanson... I think Hermanson had his most effective round in the first. Now, the fifth wound up being a little bit closer as well, mostly because Hermanson's first 90 seconds or so of the fifth, he really came out and tried to get after it for that period of time before things kind of fell back into their previous rhythm. Um, personally, my scorecard was 50-45 for Strickland. Um, like I said, the first round or maybe the fifth, I can, I'm can. i open to arguments, right? Uh, I might disagree, but I, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to have given Hermanson the first, uh, or even potentially the fifth. So I'll, I'll acknowledge that that... There were a couple of those two rounds in particular. I'm not dying on that hill. And I'm not insulting anyone for scoring them the other way than I did. I don't think that's appropriate. But Saldamato, man, um, 
that guy's name has been brought up here in this kind of context more than once, and it's been accelerating. It's happening more and more frequently. Stop hiring that man to judge fights. Um, Eric Nixick, who's one of the head coaches for Sean Strickland, he's the I believe he's the head coach over at Extreme Couture at the moment. So he's also the head coach of what, Francis and Ghanu and anyone that comes out of that camp. Um, he took he had a very polite but firm bit on Twitter about you know, if this guy's going to keep judging, he's going to cost all he's going to do is cost fighters down the line. And I think he's I think he's entirely correct. Uh, that's an indefensible score. It, it's just. It's asinine. It does. It makes no. The only way you could you could arrive at that scorecard is if you don't know the criteria you're judging, and weren't watching what was happening. That's it. Uh, s- look, saldomato has been around forever. Stop. Just stop. Stop hiring him. S- commissions. S- stop sanctioning him as a judge. I, stop it. He's he is no longer able to consistently deliver scorecards that accurately reflect what happens round over round. He needs to be done. Because this kind of crap hurts fighters. That's all it does. It hurts the people who are disadvantaged the most by everything that goes on around them. Stop hiring this man. He's bad at his job. Ugh. That goes for boxing, too. He's turned in some absolutely atrocious boxing scorecards. Uh, he needs to be done. It's more than time for him to be done judging fights. Don't know what he does next. I'm... But he needs to not do this anymore. It's well past time that we put him out to pasture as far as fight judging. So with that out of the way, the fight itself, a couple of things. I think the biggest thing, I picked Strickland, and I think I knew it was really going to go his way partway through the first round when he was able to really stop some of Hermanson's takedown attempts. Um, I mentioned in the and the preview thing that, uh, that I did last week, Jack Hermanson is primarily a grappler. Uh, it's not that he's a complete novice on the feet by any stretch of the imagination, but if he can't take you down, he really struggles to win. Uh, and when he couldn't take Strickland down the first couple of times, he put in good effort. I mean, some of his takedowns were just, they didn't even come close. There were a couple that were really good efforts on his part, and Strickland just had the appropriate defense. Uh, it was good about firing underhooks, good about breaking posture, uh, good balance anytime uh, Hermanson tried to get him in motion, Just and great about breaking out of the clinch. He didn't want to get stuck there, so he didn't get stuck there. So... Uh, As soon as that happened, you knew Hermanson was going to have a rough go of it. Um, Strickland does a lot of little things really, really well. Uh, His footwork is quite good. It's not flashy, but it's very good. He's great about using just little steps to be out of range and then into range. And if you're not really good about measuring that distance as he's moving you wind up getting hit a lot, and then you can't hit him back. He was pretty good about never getting really pushed into the fence, uh, which is an important thing. His overall defense, um, especially for his head, I mean, I I think Hermanson's um, total strikes that he landed to the head was like 13 or 11%. Let me bring up the UFC stats real fast. Um, because I, I know it was low. We're t- less than 20% uh, of the punches he threw at the head actually landed, which is a, I mean, that's a ridiculously low number. 
Uh, let's see if we have it by... Yeah, total... Let's see. Uh, I don't want to do the math on this, but yeah, he was 22 of 194 head strikes. Um, that's really low. That is really low. Uh, it, it does throw off a little bit of his landed by target status, but one of the things that Hermanson should get credit for he targeted all levels. I mean, he landed some solid calf kicks that uh, Strickland did a good job after a bit of checking them, of you kind of mitigating that weapon. But he threw a lot of good kicks. Uh, it was one of his better weapons. Strickland is normally Strickland normally kicks more than he did here. Uh, I think he was worried about the takedown, and you know, who could blame him? Uh, if your opponent's a takedown kind of aficionado, then you not yeah, then you throwing fewer kicks is just kind of a thing that makes sense. But between you know shoulder rolls, uh, proper footwork, and some good hand position and lane disruption, uh, I mean you're talking about a a full five round fight. And if you only land 22 strikes to the head over 25 minutes, I mean that's really low. That is a really low overall total. Uh, that's some really good defense to the head. Again, the leg, not quite so much. I think, if, what was he officially? Hang on. He was like 51 of 54, and I, I don't agree with that, by the way. I'm not, sh I don't, I'm not sure I agree with some of the underlying assumptions they make when they tabulate some of these, some of the lower leg strikes, but... I mean, even if I, even if you wanted to be a bit stingier about which ones count as connections than I am, uh, it, it was still fairly high. You know, we, I would say, he was still probably, you know, high 30s to low 40s out of the 54 he threw. If you, if I wanted to go by my own metrics there, uh, which is still a lot. Like that's kind of the point. That that's still a lot. Um, his body work was pretty good. Uh, Strickland didn't go a whole lot to the body. Um, he threw some, and I thought he did good. He was able to connect pretty solidly when he did. Um, ultimately, Strickland was significant strikes to the head, 125 out of 286. I mean, if you're hitting about 50% of the time, that's pretty darn good. Uh, his total was still about that. It's... Uh, it was a good performance from him defensively. It wasn't as good offensively. Uh, by his own admission, he didn't quite turn up the, the pressure the way that you'd kind of want to, but his jab was working all fight and really caused problems for Hermanson when he was trying to close distance. He just kept getting jabbed in the face. Uh, didn't he wasn't quite able to build off of it the way that you know, Strickland has in the past, but some of that could be attributed to what Hermanson was doing offensively. Some of that might have just been the pressure in the moment, which does get to you sometimes. Uh, but either way, yeah, this was... That split... This going down to split is just... That is an awful blemish on what should have been pretty handily the big... It still is the biggest win of Sean Strickland's career. And there should have been no doubt about this. Just freaking D'Amato, man. Uh... I th I enjoyed this fight more than a lot of people. Uh, that seems to be that this was not quite the action fight that you might have assumed it was going to be. But I, as a fan of technique, I got a real kick out of watching Strickland in this fight. I I know I'm in the minority in, as far as that goes, but watching his defense in particular, you know, watching the way he was moving, uh, I enjoyed that. Like, I, I really did. So, I enjoyed the heck out of this fight. I know a lot of people didn't, and fair enough. You know, I'm not here to tell you this was an action fight. We had one of those on the card, and we'll get to it soon enough. But I I found enjoyable things to watch about this fight watching it. Uh, it's unlikely that Strickland gets a title shot off of this performance. He's got a long enough winning streak. 
But, you know, this was his first real test against, you know, kind of the top of the division. I mean, these these guys were number six and number seven. Uh, Hermanson was six. Strickland was seven. So two top ten fighters. But, I mean, before this, he fought Uriah Hall. And I forget. I think Hall was ranked, but I forget exactly where. Certainly it wasn't, you know... He has not yet fought a top five middleweight. Let me just put it like that. So he's probably got one more fight that he's going to have to go through before he gets a title shot. That said, he does have a few things going for him in terms of just making the case that maybe uh, that he could get one. And the first one, we can just be honest about this, um... The top of middleweight right now, let me just go through the top. Let me go through the relevant players. You have champion Adesanya, who's fighting Robert Whitaker, who's number one. They'll be fighting next week. We'll preview that. Marvin Vittori, who Adesanya's beaten twice. Jared Cannonier sitting at number three. Adesanya's never fought him and has expressed interest, but Cannonier can't seem to get the right wins together. Derek Brunson at four, who Adesanya has already beaten. Not as champion, but he has beaten him. Number five is Paulo Costa, who Adesanya thoroughly dismantled and seems to have gone off the deep end and had the loss to Marvin Vittori. Then six, Hermanson, seven, Strickland. So one of the things going in Strickland's favor is of, let's assume he bumps up to number five, which I don't think is unreasonable given that Costa is on a two-fight losing streak and seems to have fallen apart. <laughs> His public persona has fallen apart. I don't know the man's personal life. But for the sake of argument, let's just say Strickland comes in at number five after this. Of the top five contenders, there's only there would then only be two that have not fought the champion at least once, and in some cases more than once. Now, Cannoneer, I believe, is fighting Derek Brunson. He's at, I think it's at 271. Uh... Double check that real fast. I'm uh, I'm 90%. Yeah, yeah, there it is. That that fight's also there as a. I'm I'm convinced of this. First of all, that's a good fight. I'm also convinced that that's there in case something happens to Whitaker or Adesanya, that they can still slot someone into a main event and throw an interim title onto that, which would be a pointless interim title, but they'd do it uh, because they they've got to protect that. You have to protect that title fight. I'm, I'm going to get into this when I talk about the card. It's not a bad card, but there's there's only one fight on that card worth your 75 bucks. And that's just me being honest about it on paper. So, anyway, the point there is, if Brunson wins, uh, the winner of Brunson Cannoneer is probably next. Brunson will have had a long enough winning streak, and, well, he did lose pretty badly to Adesanya the first time. It was a long enough time ago that you can kind of ex- you can kind of at least sell the narrative that Brunson has improved since then. He's not the same fighter. He kind of is, but uh, it's a more sellable fight than a quicker rematch would have been. If Cannoneer wins, I said Adesanya's expressed interest in fighting the guy. He's someone that Adesanya's never fought. He will have had a good, a pretty good win streak like that. That's probably your number one contender's fight uh, coming up on Saturday. But Strickland will be, if, again, if he's in the top five, one of only two people in, in that space that has not already lost to Israel Adesanya. And while some rematches generate interest, sometimes, you, sometimes you'd rather see something fresh, and there's, there's something to be said for that. I imagine we're going to see Strickland fight somebody else in the top five. He might fight either the loser of Cannoneer and Brunson, or I don't know what Marvin Vittori is doing. See, I don't know if he has a fight yet or not. Uh, he may or may not. Give me just a second. Uh, I I don't think, yeah, I don't think he's got one set up yet. I mean, 
in fairness, his fight with uh, his fight with Adesanya was not that long ago. I mean, that was it was late last year. Yeah, it was no, oh, sorry, it was lo- June of last year. Jeez, it's been a while. What's up with you, man? What have you been up to? Uh, oh, so, yeah, sorry, that was Vittori's last fight. Sorry, Vittori's last fight was October of last year when he beat Costa. His title fight was June. So, uh, Vittori could be... Man, Vittori and Strickland would be... <laughs> that would have one of the most awkward builds ever because you've got two... I mean, Vittori just becomes... In a, uh, he loses his cool almost at the drop of a hat. And you've got Strickland, who's... <laughs> uh, I'm going to say this again because I think it's the best way to describe him. Strickland's not as crazy as he wants you to think he is. But he is a little bit crazier than he think than he thinks he is. Uh, that would be... So we might get that. Uh... But he he will Strickland will fight someone in the top five next, and if he wins his next one, I think a title shot would be warranted. Uh, look, I enjoyed this. This wasn't uh, this wasn't the type of performance that gets the fan that will get a lot of the fans vocally behind you. Like we've got to see that guy. Uh, but sometimes all you have to do is you know uh, get the win. And he certainly did here, and should have had it by a wider uh, by a wider margin than he did. You know, Hermanson, uh, he's in a rough spot, man. It feels a little bit like his game has been figured out, uh, especially by people kind of near the top, like they've got a handle on him, and he doesn't have Plan B. You know, I, I mean. It, Think about it this way. What did Sean Strickland have to change about his game plan in the middle of that fight? You come in and you, you've got a read on your opponent, like here's the strikes they like to do, here's some of their basic strategy, here's their setups, You do they like this takedown versus that takedown, do they come out hard, do they come out slow, do they build, do they decline? Like There's a bunch of stuff you can kind of figure out about fighters like that. You study enough tape, you can build a reasonable game plan around them. If you never have to change that, uh, that's a problem. If if somebody could game plan for Jack Hermanson, and then by the time the third round starts, if Hermanson hasn't changed what he does to force another change out of you, that's a problem for Hermanson. And I think that's a problem he's running into. I don't know what the appropriate... I mean, I could talk about... Here's a bunch of skills he could maybe develop, but there's a few things that need to go into that kind of discussion. You know, one is what does he already do? Two, how old is he? He's... How old is Jack Hermanson? I know he's over 30. He's only 33. Uh, He'll be 34 in June, so he's almost... So... For the sake of argument, let's say almost 34. Uh, he's been fighting since 2010, and he's got almost 30 fights. That's kind of the point when the cement settles, you know? You get a decade or so into your career, and you get to the 30-ish fight mark. It's not impossible, but it is a bit rarer when you see someone at that point make substantive changes. Uh, so, uh, so you've got to consider that. I'm uh, I'm certainly not calling for the man to retire or anything, but he's... There's changes that need to be made there. He needs to add a plan B, C. He needs to be able to... He needs to start being able to do things that off-balance and surprise his opponents, because at the moment, and this is not just... I bring this up because this wasn't just Sean Strickland. 
this was this has been the case for Hermanson's last several opponents. Um, Edmund Shab- look, he beat Edmund Shabazian by wide decision. Fair. Uh, that first round still, though, like, even, when Hermanson's game started working against Shabazian, it wasn't because he changed what he was doing, right? It was more because Shabazian kind of started falling apart. When he fought Marvin Vittori, this was a big problem for him in the Vittori fight. Vittori kind of got a bead on him, and Hermanson could never adjust. Uh, that was certainly a big problem for him in the Cannoneer fight. I mean, it's been a problem in fights he's won. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, the Jacare fight was kind of was one of his big kind of coming out moments. And Jacare took a round or two off of him, and Hermanson didn't really make a tremendous adjustment. So he's, I think that's going to be something he really has to address. Uh, He's got a lot of talent, you know, but he doesn't seem to have, you know, plans B, C, D, and E. It's plan A, and we're just going to keep doing plan A, and if plan A stops working, well, we're just going to stick with plan A. And when you're good enough at plan A, that will get you to a certain point, but I think he's reached that point, and he needs to add some kind of layers to his game that aren't there at the moment. So, not the fireworks we uh, some people might have expected in the main event, but I certainly, I didn't hate it, personally. All right, the rest of this should go a little bit quicker. <laughs> Co-main event. Did not agree with this one. Um, Nick Maximov defeated Punahele Soriano by split decision. Uh, there was a 29-28 for each man, and then a 30-27 for Maximov. That I don't get. Um... I was 29-28 Soriano. I'm not dying on the hill here. Um, the 30-27, that, that ain't good. Um, was that... Who turned in that scorecard? I've, that might have been either Cleary or Sal D'Amato. I'd have, clear, I'd have to double check that. But whoever it was, um, that's not a good card. Giving Maximov the first in particular seems really suspect to me. Um, Soriano did mo- d- was the only one doing damage pretty much this entire fight. They had some really excellent wrestling exchanges. Uh, give credit to both men for that. It just seemed like in the second round, I think, uh, Soriano suffered some kind of a leg injury. I don't know if it was knee, I don't know if it was muscle or what, but it, it let Maximov do a lot of kind of lay and pray in the third. So for me, it comes down to how you score the second round. And personally, if you if the biggest criteria is um, effective offense, then I think Soriano should have won the second round. Because I don't think Maximov did a whole lot of offense uh, of offense in that round. His wrestling game is quite good. He's good about finding positions. Uh, I'm not trying to dump on Maximov here. I, I'm really not. I just the scoring of the the 30-27 baffles me a little bit. If you gave Maximov the second, I disagree, but I don't think it's wrong. Um. Maximov needs to be clear about what I'm about to say. A couple of things. One, Maximov is a young guy. He's like early 20s, like 23, I think. And he's got, this was what, his like ninth fight, I think. So we're talking about somebody 23-ish, less than 10 fights. My criticism that I'm that I'm about to mention here is heavily tempered with that reality in mind. He is young, and there's a lot of room and a lot of time for him to grow. But if he wants to employ the style that he showed here, uh, very wrestling heavy, and he's pretty darn good at it, so if you want to do this, I'm not saying don't do it, but he needs to be 
able to um, inflict more damage. Uh, he needs to find ways to uh, throw in offensive moves when he's got top position. He needs better ground and pound. He needs... Uh, I don't even want to say he needs more aggressive submissions because I don't think that's necessarily the case. But he j- he's got... A really his wrestling is really good. That's both the takedowns and the scrambling. Like that's really good. He is a he is doggedly determined. Once he makes contact, like that that's a real asset to him. But he's got to find ways to start putting some exclamation marks on those kind of moments. Because if he does, if he gets off some solid ground and pound in that second round. That's not close. Like, if he's able to do something with his control positions, he wins that second round a bit cleaner. He wins the third. Uh, but you can keep rolling the dice like this, man. He's got a couple of... This is... Um, I think his other UFC fight was... His most recent UFC fight was a split decision. I think it was his debut. Same kind of thing, man. You've got to start finding ways to... Put some offensive oomph behind what you're doing. Now, as I said, young in both age and low mileage. Plenty of time for that to happen, but that is, I think, what needs to happen next for him. Uh, Because if he runs up against another guy like Soriano, that might go a lot worse. And as I said, I thought he lost this one. Uh, Welterweight. Ooh, boy. Shavkat Rachmanov defeats Carlston Harris via knockout. Uh, uh, Wheel kick, spinning hook kick, I don't know. If you want to get really pedantic, there is a difference between those two. I just call it a wheel kick for the sake of... Because I don't want to have to put spinning in front of hook kick when I type it out sometimes. So I just say wheel kick for the 360 attack. It's a minor point of semantics, and I don't care enough to get into any kind of screaming debate over it, but that's just so you all know where I'm coming from. And then punches on the ground to follow up. Uh, guys, if you're not already... If you weren't on the bandwagon for Rachmanov before this fight, now's a good time to jump on. Uh... I was very high on this guy after his UFC debut. I then went back and found some of his other fights in M1. This guy is really, really good. He's undefeated. He has finished all of his opponents. And we're only ta- this was only his third fight in the UFC, so I am not anointing him the next future champion. What I am going to say is the following. People don't want to fight this guy for a reason. He's good everywhere. Watch what he did to uh, Cowboy Oliveira in his UFC debut. Beat him on the feet, caught him in a guillotine. Watch what he did to Michelle Prezeresh. A lot of you may not remember Michelle Prezeresh when, from when he was, you know, he was never like top, top of the division. But he was always a sturdy roadblock. Like he was a guy that, if you were gonna be, so, if you were somebody in that division, you could beat him. But if you weren't, and if you weren't dialed in, he'd ruin. He he would ruin your night, man. Uh, he was always a tough, tough roadblock that a lot of talented, some very talented fighters stumbled against and had to rebound. And he went through him like he like he was nothing. Now here, Carlston Harris is a solid fighter. And Rachmanov had him swinging at air. I mean, just at air. Um, Had a couple of nice takedown attempts that Harris was able to kind of defend, mostly because Harris has a freakishly... That is a lanky dude, man. And he was able to kind of keep his legs in position to avoid some body lock attacks uh, from Rachmanov. But that finish, don't don't be fooled by the flashiness of the spinning kick. 
it didn't land all that clean. It landed well enough and with enough force to off-balance Harris, but watch what happens afterward. That's what should scare you if you have to fight this guy. He gets on top and he stands over Harris. And his ground and pound is straight, powerful, and accurate. And he put Harris to sleep. Uh, I am not going to say future champion with it as a guarantee, but that that man is a problem for that entire division. Look, if you put him in there against Kamaru Usman tomorrow, would I pick Usman? Yeah, easily. Do I think that's an easy fight for Kamaru Usman? I do not. Uh, and I expect Rachmanov to just keep getting better. I mean, he's a relatively young guy. Yeah, he's 27. Good lord, he was born in 1994. I'm so old. Um, so we've got a. This guy is young. He's pretty big for the division. He's 6'1. Uh,. Got a 77-inch reach, which is... He's on the lanky side. He's on the big side for the division. And... That guy can fight everywhere. He can fight at range. He's good about making you miss encountering. He can fight in the clinch. He can fight on top. And he is scarily good. If he gets you down and he's able to posture up, especially if he can get his feet under him, the art of standing over a downed opponent and punching them effectively is... Not a lot of people do that very well in MMA. Modern MMA, at least. That's, that's a bit of an art form that, for a variety of reasons, has kind of fallen by the wayside. He is scarily good at it. Uh, that guy is... Uh, he is going to be a fixture at the top of that division. That I do feel confident about. I might even go so far as to say I feel pretty confident he will fight for the title at some point. And I will not be at all shocked if he wins it. He is a very, very good fighter. Uh, our next fight at light heavyweight. This fight came about on fight week, like I recorded this fight to preview Sam Alvey and uh, Phil Hawes. Unlike Tuesday, Phil Hawes fell out and was replaced by Brendan Allen. That's when the fight moved from middleweight to light heavyweight. Uh, would not have changed my pick. I don't pick Sam Alvey to win at this point. Brendan Allen defeats Sam Alvey via rear naked choke, 210 of the second. Um, fairly back and forth, for most of the first round. Uh, then Allen kind of drops Alvey with a right hand near the end of the round. Second round comes out a bit more of the same. He comes in with a right to the body, comes upstairs with a left hook, classic punching combination. Drops Alvey down nearly onto his face, jumps on the back, no hooks, grabs the rear naked choke, and when you get the mechanics of that choke locked in with your arms... You don't need the hooks if it's deep enough. There's just nothing you can do. And that's kind of where he wound up here. Gets the tap. <clears throat> um, Sam Alvey now ties BJ Penn for the longest winless streak at eight fights. Post-fight, Alvey... Uh, th this came out earlier today, I think. Alvey says he's not retiring, but he does need to fix things and is putting the career on hiatus for a bit, so... Look, I've... I've been very hard on Sam Alvey in the sense that I don't think he belongs in the UFC anymore and hasn't for some time. That's an assessment of the results in his style, and I stand by it. I don't necessarily take pleasure in that, because this is a man's livelihood. And fighters, you know, they get screwed left, right, and center, man. So I don't, I don't take pleasure in saying that Sam Alvey... It should it needs to you know, not be paid anymore, right? Like I'm, 
I say that because it is my honest assessment of the situation, not because I hate the man. I don't have anything against Sam Alvey other than the, some of the terrible fights that I've had to sit through. And that's not entirely on him all the time. He's a common denominator, but some of the other people he's been in the cage with have done their share to make those fights suck out loud. But I... Look, if he's able to kind of reassess things and maybe come back... At this point, the UFC will give him whatever he wants, apparently. I I don't understand it, but they will. Uh... Solid win for Allen, who seems... he That guy needs to find some consistency. He's got a lot of ability, but... The times he's stumbled have been pretty damning stumbles, you know? Uh, only twice in the UFC, Sean Strickland and Chris Curtis both stopped him. And... They were just... He's had good wins. He's a good grappler in particular, but some of the... The Strickland win was... uh, That was pretty damning. Not because Strickland isn't good. In fact, if we're just talking about quality of opposition, that loss has aged fairly well. It's more in the details about how it happened. Somewhat ditto the Chris Curtis loss. So, if he's able to rebound and really kind of find himself again... Good on him. He's a fairly young guy and, again, has a lot of ability. So if he's able to kind of shore up some of the issues that have that he's run into, then yeah, good for him. Middleweight? God, this fight. Um, Brian Battle defeated Trasan Gore via unanimous decision. 29-28s across the board. Um, apparently, this was supposed to be the finale of some recent season of The Ultimate Fighter. I don't know. Tough hasn't mattered for 10 years now, at least. At least. Uh, if that wasn't good, what do you want me to say? Gore has power, but he's a guy with... This was like his fourth professional fight. He's three and one. Yeah, I... I don't care. <laughs> um, Battle just had a higher output. It's kind of what it came down to. If that wasn't good. Speaking of fights, uh, on the flip side of that, we had our you know, kickoff to the main card. Julian Arosa defeats Steven Peterson via split decision, 29-28. So two for Arosa, one for Peterson. Uh, man, I don't know if the audio is going to pick up this or not, but I'm going to clap for this fight, man. Bravo. Brutal war. These two guys just got in each other's faces. Uh, Arosa pretty clearly had the first. I think that was probably the easiest round. Peterson got off of the back foot more in the second and had a lot more success. He got dropped. Hurts Arosa a couple of times. Arosa's lead hand and shoulder, the shoulder in particular, he carries him low. And once Peterson got a better bead on him, was hitting him with the overhand right constantly. Uh, hurt him in that round. I gave Peterson the second. But for whatever it's worth, in the second round at one point, Arosa drops Peterson with a spinning back fist. Um, crazy momentum swings, third round, they, this was just a, a bloody war, uh, I scored it for Arosa, I gave him one and three, third round was, I suppose, close enough that I'm not gonna scream too much over a judge giving that one to, giving Peterson two to one, so I don't agree, but it's, uh, it's not the end of the world, uh, phew, tremendous fight, there's a cloud hanging over this, though. Um, Peterson missed weight, and he missed weight pretty badly. He weighed 149 for this fight. Now, that would be bad enough. I'm going to go over this in a second. Um, that's bad enough. It's This was, however, the second time in a row he missed weight. He missed weight for his previous fight as well. That's a problem. And it really sucks. But he's got to get... Look, I I am more understanding than a lot of people about about weight when it comes to fighters. But this is one of... I say this all the time, too. The, I give everybody one just because of the randomness of the universe. It's going to happen. You do, that, you do that enough, it's going to happen at some point. Something is going to go wrong. 
It just becomes inevitable. If it happens more than once, you've got a problem. If it happens consecutively, you've got a problem. And I think that's where he is. Now, here's the only other thing I want to say about this. Peterson missed weight, which, as I said, I... You signed to fight at the weight. It is on you. Right? I, I will be a bit more forgiving than others. But you still you still signed to fight at a weight. So you getting fined 30% of your purse for missing weight. Uh, that sucks, man. It really does. But it's less... Let me put... It's less clear to me that that's the best way to go about it rather than uh, maybe just starting with a point deduction, you know, just whatever you score at the end of the fight, you take it a minus one because you missed weight. I don't know. That's it. That's an idea I've heard floated that I don't hate. Uh, these two got fight of the night. Clearly not a lot of not much of a contest there. However, because Peterson missed weight, he was ineligible for that bonus, so Erosa gets the whole 100k. So I just... I rewatch this fight, if you haven't seen it. If you have seen it. If you haven't, watch it. Great fight. Then understand something. Steven Peterson got paid peanuts for that. That's one of the best fights of the year. Now, granted, it's February. Will it hold up to the end of the year? I don't know. But for that fight, for the effort that man put in to get no part of the bonus and to be fined on top of it, on in addition to making such little money to begin with, Yeah, I know. I shoehorned fighter uh, a bit of a fighter pay discussion here into this, but and look, that's not me saying that you know a fine is not potentially an appropriate thing to levy at fighters who miss weight. I'm not. I'm not coming down on that side of it. I, look, might a point deduction be more of a deterrent? Maybe. Maybe a fine is isn't the worst thing in the world, but we're dealing with such low bases that it just it just leaves kind of a bad taste in my mouth. You can say it's his fault, and he should have made weight. And I'm not here to defend a guy missing weight by four pounds. Three for non-title, if you want to be very loose. I'm not here to defend that. You signed to fight at 145. It is your. It is on you to make 145. But you see somebody go out there and give all of that that he gave to this fight, and to know that he walked away... He might have lost money on this venture, candidly. Um, that's just... That just really sucks. And it needs to be said out loud a bit more often, I think. All right, that was your main card. We had 13 fights overall. As for the prelims, um, John Castaneda defeated Miles Johns via technical submission and arm triangle choke in the third, put Johns to sleep. Solid performance out of Castaneda overall. Good about making Johns miss. Good about uh, just poking at him with kicks, punches, evasive maneuver. Good stuff out of Castaneda. Featherweight, Hakeem Dawadu defeated My- uh, Michael Trezano via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the boards. Not a whole lot to say about that one. Dawadu just a better fighter. Middleweight, Chidi Njikawani, the, I believe, younger brother of Anthony Njikawani. And if you're if you've been around as long as I have, you remember Anthony Njikawani as a bit of a terror in the featherweight division in uh, the WEC days, when that was, promotion was alive and well, and had a couple of fights in the UFC. He had a fight, Anthony Njikawani, had a fight with uh, Edson Barboza, if memory serves, um, where he was probably on his way to winning before Barboza caught him with a wheel kick, didn't knock him out, but dropped him near the end of the third and probably saved Barboza that fight, to be from what I remember. Um, I believe the ne- very next fight, Barboza would knock Terry Adam out with a wheel kick. But he he tried that thing out on uh, Anthony and Jaquani and nearly got it. Anyway, Chidi uh, knocks out Marc-Andre Barrio 
with punches in 16 seconds. Um, second fastest win by a, de- <clears throat> by a debuting fighter ever, I think they said. Number one probably still goes to Makwan Amir Khani, if I had to guess at that record, but don't hold me to that. Uh, just a really nice one-two from uh, Njikwani. He times it with an inside leg kick that Barrio throws, but Barrio drops his lead hand as he throws it. Well, that's not a good thing. Jab connects, and Barrio's left hand comes up more like he's kind of pawing or trying to throw a check hook instead of coming up to defend because the right hand follows and just crushes him. Uh, Barrio's a very durable fighter, so for Injikawani to do that to him, that says a lot. Uh, women's bantamweight Alexis Davis defeats Yulia Stolyarenko via unanimous decision. 229-27s and 130-27. Um, I gave Stolyarenko the second. And I don't hate a 10-8 for Davis in the third. Um, Stoliarenko had a couple of armbar attempts in the first. One of them was okay. The others looked worse than they were. But Stoliarenko just way too complacent on her back. Let Davis get on top and just elbow her. Must she looked for armbars. It's just not a great look. Second round almost enti- was entirely on the feet, actually. I gave that to Stoliarenko. Uh, there was an upkick in the first round. Uh, that stole your ankle and an, an Ill- illegal one, I can speak. Uh, kind of thought a point should have been taken there, personally, but I'm not the ref. Uh, third round, a little bit more back and forth on the feet. Davis uh, gets a takedown at one point, and more of the same from the first round, just... Stolia uh her arm bars from her back became less and less effective, and she just took more and more damage in the third. So I don't disagree with a 10-8 in the third for Davis at all. I didn't go that way, but it was... I probably should have. I- I've been trying to make a, con- a more conscious effort to... If if something's kind of a borderline 10-8, let me just lean towards, towards 10-8s and see what that does to kind of my personal scorecards. Just out of curiosity. Uh, solid win for Davis. Light heavyweight. Got to talk about this guy just a little bit. Um, Jaiten Almeida defeats Danilo Marquez via TKO. This was uh, punches and hammer fists from the mount. 257 of the first. Almeida's top pressure is kind of nuts, especially for a guy of his size. Um, he got Marquez down fairly quickly. Constantly was fighting for uh, wrist control to kind of get, uh, I think the joking, jokingly referred to as the Dagestani handcuff. So that's like my right hand behind your back, grabbing your right hand, isolating it, then I just punch you in the face with my left. So that kind of thing. Fighting for that. Got full mount and just unloaded. Marquez wasn't thrilled with the stoppage. He wasn't taking tremendous damage, but, and this is a big but... Covering up is good. It's a good sign that you're still kind of there. Not always, but it, it, it's better than not be, It's better than not covering up. But in a position like that, you have to then be able to address the position, right? Like if I'm backed, if, if we're boxing and I'm backed into a corner and the other guy's teeing off on me and all I'm doing is covering, all I'm doing is covering up, the ref's going to stop it. Now I can argue I'm covering up, I'm blocking. But if I'm not doing anything to address the fact that this other guy is teeing off on me and I'm in a corner, that the referee then kind of has an obligation to save me from my from you know taking damage that serves no purpose. Same kind of thing here. Were these the most devastating hammer fists and punches ever? No, they were hard. Don't mean I don't mean to undersell the man uh, Almeida's power, but no, not the most devastating ever. But if you're not doing anything or if you're incapable of doing anything to address the fact that another human being is on top of you in full mount, punching you in the face, even if you're blocking, you've got to be able to address the position. Otherwise, you're just going to keep getting hit. And he never was able to really address the position. And the referee, it's not like the referee just jumped in out of nowhere. He did tell Marquez more than once, you've got to... When a ref says defend yourself and you're mounted, it's not just get your hands up and block the punches. That's part of it. 
but you have to be able to address the mount. Now, maybe that's giving up your back and trying to work for something from there. Maybe it's you can push on the hips. There's a lot of things you can do. And if you don't, and you're just getting hit, then what are we doing? And that's kind of the, that's kind of where this one ended for me. I was perfectly fine with the stoppage. Uh, welterweight Philip Rowe defeated Jason Witt via uh, TKO punches, 215 of the second. Uh, s- Witt with a wrestling-heavy approach to the first. Rowe is an enormous welterweight, by the way. I mean, this guy is, what, 6'3"? Yeah. He's 6'3", with an 80-inch reach. That's nuts for welterweight. Uh, the finishing sequence was very nice. This is how you... This is how you use your reach advantage if you're in this position. Everything he was landing on when he landed this nice three-punch combination, right at the end of his reach. So Wit doesn't have anything to really offer as far as counters go, and he just gets punched in the face until he falls over. Uh, not, nice stuff from Rowe there on the finish. And to kick off the entire affair... Malcolm Gordon defeated Dennis Bondar via technical submission. There was a dislocation to Bondar's left elbow. 122 of the first. A little bit unfortunate. These two guys were going at it. Um, Gordon threw up a... He is of the opinion that an armbar he attempted uh, compromised the left elbow. Then when Bondar was trying to post and wall walk, his elbow visibly left the uh the joint like there there's a it, it again the the elbow separated dislocated something bad uh bondar immediately gave the old cry uh, gave a scream tapped out like he knew what was up he knew he was done um unfortunate i was looking i was uh for a short fight, that was a... Uh, they were going at it for as long as that lasted. And that was the card. Again, 13 fights, some hits, some misses. Uh, yeah, just you know, kind of was what it was as far as that went. Your post-fight bonuses, such as they are. Um, Erosa and Steven Peterson with your fight of the night, so Erosa gets the full 100k. Performances of the night go to Shavkat Rachmanov and Chidi and Jaquani, who could possibly object to either of those. <laughs> uh, yeah, if I were to recommend anything from this card, if you're an if you're a nerd for technique, watching what Sean Strickland does in the Hermanson fight is kind of interesting. If you're not, Rachmanov and Harris, uh, and Arosa and Peterson are, uh, and yeah. I mean, it's 16 seconds. Watching Jaquani blow Mark Andre Barrio out of the water. That would kind. Of, those would kind of be the ones that I would go really maybe go out of your way to watch if you haven't seen them already. So, uh, thank you to everyone who followed along with my live coverage of that in the MMA Zone of 411mania.com or have read the report after the fact. I appreciate all of that from all of you. So, thank you very very much. Okay, let's move on. UFC 271 this coming Saturday. Ooh, baby. Your main event. The rematch for the UFC middleweight title. Champion Israel Adesanya goes for his fourth defense, I believe. Let me double check that real fast. Um, yeah, fourth. He defended against Romero, Costa, and then Vittori. So he is, yeah. So going for number four against the former champion, Sir Robert of Knuckles himself, uh, Robert Whitaker. Um, hmm. I mean, the only guy to beat Whitaker at middleweight is Adesanya. Well, let me start with this. I lean towards Adesanya... But I expect this to look almost nothing like their first fight. I think their first fight, Whitaker, by his own admission, was burned out. That man had been 
training every day for like six years. I mean, he had kind of a uh, a breakdown when he was out running dunes on Christmas rather than being with his family. Like I, 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 as someone who's had a couple of a uh, minor mental health catastrophes like that, I can certainly empathize. Uh, he was also, if you watch that fight, he's very amped up. Um, he's attacking, it's not that he never attacks, I want to be, he's doing a lot of the same attack repeatedly, and he's over-swinging a lot, uh, which is something you do when you're kind of, you got nervous energy. Whereas Adesanya in that first fight is cool as cool as a cucumber, man. Just slipping, moving, countering. Uh, that's that's such a wonderful performance from Adesanya, and I don't think it, I don't think the totality of it really got the credit it deserved at the time. Uh, I think I think people have gone back and rewatched it and really started to appreciate what Adesanya did there. One of the things that Adesanya has mentioned about that fight, um, and I've rewatched some Whitaker fights recently, and I think it's true. Whitaker doesn't like a gunfight, which might sound weird, but hear me out. Whitaker doesn't spend a tremendous amount of time in the pocket. Um, he he does a lot of kind of the bouncing from the outside, and then he will blitz in. Uh, with either just, you know a combination or he throws a really lovely like one two to right head kick. Uh, there's a lot. There's so much that that Robert Whitaker is good at. He's one of the most well-rounded fighters in the sport. His technique on the feet is very smooth. He's got power in his hands and his feet. He can wrestle. He's been doing that a little bit more. He took Kelvin Gastelum down several times in their fight. I mean, frankly, he had an easier time with Gaslam than uh, Adesanya did. I think that's more a stylistic thing than anything else. Uh, but he doesn't really do a lot of um, you know, gunslinging, a lot of pocket fighting. And I think that's one of the things that Adesanya and his camp keyed into in that first fight was when he, when he blitzes, he's used to his opponent trying to get out of the way, like really out of the way. And Adesanya was really well measured in that he would just slide just a little bit, you know, enough to make him miss and then look to counter. And those prolonged exchanges in the pocket, uh, Adesanya had a distinct advantage. That's where he dropped him at the end of the first. It's where he finished him in the second. So I, now if Whitaker's more disciplined in his approach, I don't know that we find ourselves in that position as often as we did in the first fight, which is why I don't think this one's going to resemble that first fight a whole lot. I still favor Adesanya, like I said. I think his defense is top-notch. I think he's good defensively. I think, I think the way he stays light and slides is just a really tough thing for someone who does the kind of more bouncing blitzes that Whitaker... I think that's a bad style matchup. Just kind of across the board. Not an impossible one to overcome, but a tough one. I think we'll see Whitaker try to integrate some more wrestling this time around. I don't... How successful he'll be, I don't know. But I think he's going to try. Uh, they'll be in Houston for this card, so they'll... If this were in the 25-foot cage, would that change my pick? That's a... hmm. I think we'd see a lot more clinching if they were in the smaller cage. They're in the bigger one, so we might still get a lot of clinching. I don't mean to say we won't. But... Uh, the bigger cage, I think, does favor Adesanya. Uh, you know, the ability to switch stances... The fakes, uh, the ability to attack all levels. I think Whitaker. I think Whitaker will perform better than he did in their first fight. He might even win. He's that good a fighter. You know, I, I certainly don't mean to say that I ha that I can't see ways for him to win. But 
ultimately, if it's you know, who do I think is going to win, I I do lean towards the champion. Uh, that said, I was very excited for their first fight. I am more so excited for this one. I think both men have uh, refined things since their first meeting. I think it's going to be a great fight. I can't wait for it. So excited. So pumped. Please don't let anything happen to this fight in the week building up to it. Please don't do that to me. Uh, yeah, so great fight. Really looking forward to it. Co-main event. Ugh. Derek Lewis is going to fight Tai Tuivasa. They'll be in Houston, so Derek Lewis will get a very large hometown pop, I'm sure. Ugh. I'm going to pick Derek Lewis. Am I? Hang on. Let's let's think about this seriously for a second. Taito Ivasa is going to stand and trade with Derek Lewis. It's how he fights. And I've said this before about Derek Lewis. The people who stand and trade with him, who know how to fight on the feet, actually tend to do better <laughs> than people who just try to wrestle him to death. Uh, the question is, does Tai Tuivasa have enough technical skill to really make that work? Ultimately, this is a lot closer than you might think. I'm still going to lean towards Derek Lewis, but uh, that it's not by much. It's not by much. All right, next up, we have, uh, again, our two fighters who are basically serving as uh, uh, understudies for the main event. When Jared Cannonier fights Derek Brunson, it's a good fight. It's a good fight in its own right. I don't mean to disparage it. Brunson's been on a pretty good run. Uh, he's on, what, a f five? Yeah, five-fight winning streak. Hasn't lost since he fought Israel Adesanya. Here's the thing. He's been doing a lot. He's been getting back to his wrestling a lot, which has led to success. I don't know how well that'll work against Cannoneer, who's a pretty good counter-wrestler. Um, it's a tough one. It's a real tough one. Uh, Cannoneer hits harder. Cannoneer has a penchant for stopping people at middleweight. Um, I don't think this. I think they're both southpaws. Would change anything? Yeah, Brunson's southpaw, and I think Cannoneer is. No, he's orthodox. Yeah, does that change anything? Um, hmm. not really. It largely comes down to whether or not Cannoneer can land before Brunson gets him down or deter Brunson's takedowns enough. If this were five rounds, I might actually feel more comfortable picking Brunson over three. Yeah, I'm actually going to lean towards Cannoneer. I'm not entirely sold on Brunson's chin. And Cannoneer, he brings some heat. Might be wrong. I'm prepared to be wrong on that one, but it's a pretty close fight from where I sit. Uh, bantamweight, Kyler Phillips and Marcelo Rojo. I believe I'm going to go with Phillips here. Yeah. Yeah. Going with Phillips. I don't have a whole lot about this one. Lightweight, Bobby Green and Nazrat Hakparast. That's a pretty good fight. Green coming off of the win over Ally Aquinta. Uh, stopped him in the first round, man. Pretty brutal. Uh, Hack Perast. He got out-wrestled by Dan Hooker. This is a pretty good fight. I'm going to lean towards Bobby Green, uh, which is weird for me to say. But... Yeah, I mean, if Hask Perest dedicates himself to a wrestling approach, it's more likely to be successful, but I think he's just going to be a little bit too accommodating of fighting green on the feet. 
I'm going to go with Bobby Green. Anyway, that's your pay-per-view card. I said, I think the main event is the only thing there worth your uh, worth the price of purchase, but uh, Whitaker and Adesanya is absolutely worth the price of purchase. <laughs> All right, as for the prelims, heavyweight, Andre Arlovsky and Jared Vandera. Seriously going to pick Arlovsky here? I think I am. I feel dirty about it because I shouldn't be picking Arlovsky, but yeah, picking Arlovsky. Women's flyweight, Roxanne Modafferi and Casey O'Neill. Uh, this could be a rough one for Modafferi, man. Doing a two-fight skid. And Casey O'Neill is nasty. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going with O'Neill. Uh, flyweight. Alex Perez and Matt Schnell. This was supposed to happen earlier, I seem to recall. Uh, yeah, Schnell had some kind of a medical issue. They were supposed to fight at the... Um, uh, oof, do. The Brunson and Till card. Let's see, Perez hasn't fought since he lost to Davis and Figueredo in November of 2020. Pretty significant layoff. Uh, Schnell fought May of last year. That should be a pretty good fight, actually. I'm, I'm going to lean towards Schnell, and I might feel foolish because Perez is pretty darn good. But I'm going to lean towards Schnell. Um, William Knight and Maxim Grishin. Let's see. Grishin, 1-1 one one in the UFC. Missed weight his last time out when he fought uh, Dustin Jacoby. Whereas Knight... Had that terrible fight with Alonzo Menafield. That fight sucked. Um, I'm going to pick Knight. See, and as for the earlier part of the prelims, yeah, that's a long card. How big is this card? Hang on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, this is a 15 fight card. What the hell are you doing? What are you doing this to me? Uh, anyway, Bantamweight. Leomana Martinez against Ronnie Lawrence. Um, I believe this is the UFC debut for Martinez. I'm going to confirm that very quickly. Um, where are you? Why does this look so different over here? Okay, the wiki might not have been updated appropriately. Um. Huh. Well, if I come across it, I'll... Yeah, there it is. Sorry. Um, let's see. Oh, Mana Martinez. Knew that first name was wonky. Uh, yeah, he beat Guido Canetti. Hmm. Whereas Lawrence... Yeah, also had a successful UFC debut. He beat Vince Cachero uh, about a year ago, actually. Um, hmm. That's a tough one, uh, believe it or not. I'm going to lean towards Martinez, I think, but could be very wrong there. Now, let's see. Alexander Hernandez and Hanato Moicano. That's a pretty darn good fight to be stuck all the way down here on the early prelims. Let's see, Hernandez, been out of, uh, been in action pretty recently. Sorry, October of last year. Uh, Moicano beat Jai Herbert. Yeah, it was after he got stopped by Rafael Fizeev. That's why I'm just splitting the difference between Fizeev and Fizeev, so... <laughs> You're going to get about 50% of each pronunciation there. That's a pretty good fight, actually. I'm going to lean towards Moicano, but that's a good fight. Light heavyweight, Carlos Ulberg and Fabio Charant. Um, Ulberg, 3-1, and one, lost his UFC debut. Uh, I don't like guys with this little experience in the UFC as a general rule. It's so rare that that actually winds up working out. 
Um, Zetchaku kind of got... He got a little bit fortunate with that fight not being stopped in the first. Not saying it was a terrible non-stoppage, but that could have been stopped. Uh, Charant, I think you mentioned, lost to William Knight. I believe that was his... I believe that was his debut. No, he lost to Alonzo Menafield too. Yeah, yeah, he... Oh, I remember that. Yeah, he got Von Flew choked by Menafield. Yeah, pick an Olberg. Pick an Olberg. Middleweight, A.J. Dobson and Jacob Malkoon. Dobson is undefeated. Uh, 6-0, and making his debut off of a win on the Contender Series. Whereas Malkoon... One and one in the UFC, lost to Phil Hawes in quick fashion, then beat Abdul Razak Al Hassan in a rebound fight. I'm gonna lean towards Malkoon here, but uh, you're talking about guys with like they each have six professional fights. You know, there's there's no way to feel confident making a prediction there. Um, Douglas Silva de Andrade is still kicking around. Why did I think he'd retired? Uh, anyway, he's coming off of a win. He's been trading wins and losses dating back to 2017. Um, anyway, he's fighting Sergei Morozov. And Morozov, I, uh, he's fought in the UFC, right? Twice, actually. Um, lost to Umar Nurmagomedov and then beat Khalid Taha. Um... His losses are to Umar Nurmagomedov, Movslar Evloyev. Yeah. Um, other, otherwise, we're going back to like 2016 to get to his next other loss. So, only losing to those two guys, man. Uh, and he's, are these any names? Not that it'll mean anything to any of you guys. Um, I'm going to pick Morozov here, but this is a stiff test. Um... Silva de Andrade is, uh, he's a stiff test. You know, at this point in time, that's kind of what he is. He's a, he's a measuring stick, right? He's a roadblock. He's a really tough gatekeeper, and I don't say that pejoratively. So, we'll see how, Mor we'll see if Morozov can hang with, uh, someone as, uh, seasoned as de Andrade. And kicking everything off, Jeremiah Wells and Mike Mathitha. Uh, I'm going with Mathitha until I hear otherwise, so I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your, uh, that gentleman's last name. He's only 3-0. Is he playing out of city kickboxing or something? Um, it's out of New Zealand. But there's other gyms besides that. I don't know. Um, anyway, Wells, by contrast... 9-2-1, and one, beat Worley Alves in his UFC debut. I'm going to lean towards Wells. Uh, I think he's just a little bit more proven a commodity, which is pretty much universally true of fighters who, uh, when you go against someone who's only 3-0. and oh. So, But, again, two young enough guys that anything could happen once they get into the cage. So I will be covering that. This coming Saturday in the MMA Zone of 411mania.com. So if you are so inclined, please do stop by and say hello. I always appreciate that. Yeah, I am psyched for that main event, man. I am really pumped. All right, let's get into some news, and then we will see about getting out of here. So the Ultimate Fighter is going to return for another season because ESPN is happy with what they drew on ESPN Plus, I guess. I don't know. Didn't watch a single second of it, and I won't. Our coaches are going to be Amanda Nunes and Juliana Pena to set up their fight. I believe they're fighting for the f women's featherweight belt. Uh, which will be odd, but whatever. And it's going to be a season of men's heavyweights and women's featherweights. <laughs> why? You know what? No, I'm not going to do the why thing. I'm not... I don't care. I'm not watching it. And... So, you want to have the worst divisions possible represented here? Knock yourselves out. 
I don't care. I could not possibly, I seriously, I could not possibly care less about the existence of the Ultimate Fighter or anything they do with that creatively bankrupt, utterly useless and, uh, IP. Don't care one iota. I care moderately more about the umpteenth time John Jones teased everyone on Twitter about coming back and fighting at heavyweight than I do about that. Uh, for the record, John said, he tweeted something like, you know, the light heavyweight goat against the heavyweight goat, and half of Twitter immediately went, when did the UFC sign Fedor? <laughs> Um, obviously more in reference to a potential fight between him and Stipe Miocic. Um, look, I, I, I don't care. John's Twitter credibility when it comes to stuff like this is negative. Uh, if they make the fight, fine. I will be excited for that fight if it gets made, but I, I, anybody that cares what John Jones tweets at this point about fights is just trying to fuel the, the clickbait machine. And that's not what I do here, so I don't care. <laughs> but and the point there, I care more that John decided to trot that old chestnut out than I do about this season of The Ultimate Fighter or anything related to The Ultimate Fighter. Uh, Alright, we got some fights being filled out. UFC 272 and UFC 273 both got some, uh, some fleshing out done to their cards. So let's start with 272 which is currently scheduled to take place March 5th at the T-Mobile Arena. Supposed to be headlined by Colby Covington and Jorge Masvidal. If you're going to have a non-title fight main eventing a pay-per-view, which I think they should more often, this is a perfectly acceptable fight to uh, to do that with. Uh, those two have some heat. Um, there's still a fair amount of kind of star power and buzz around both guys, so... It's not a deep card beyond that as things currently stand. Um, also on that card, just as it currently stands. So We've also got Marina Rodriguez and Jan Xiaonan. It's in Barboza and Bryce Mitchell. That's a rough fight for Bryce Mitchell. Not an easy fight for Barboza, but that could go really badly for Mitchell. Uh, Devante Smith and Eric Gonzalez. Marina Moroz and Mar uh, Maria Agapova. Jalen Turner and Jamie Malarkey, Nikolai Negomerianu and Ihor uh, Potersha? Poteria? I don't know where that gentleman is from. Uh, I will figure out how to pronounce his name more when we have to do an actual preview, so apologies if I'm very off. Kevin Holland and Alex Oliveira, Jaskai, Minan Foyro, Tim Elliott and Tigir Ulanbekov. That's not bad, but they'll stick it on the prelims because the UFC hates flyweights. Mikhailo Oleksajic and Justin and Dustin Jacoby. That's not the worst. And Sergey Spivak and Greg Hardy got rescheduled for this event. That is the worst. So not a deep card at the moment, but we might get one or two more fights added to that. That's a pretty long card already. So it's not going to be a deep card as it currently stands. And UFC 273 set for April. Uh, April 9th, to be specific, scheduled to take place at the Vistar Veterans Memorial Arena in Jacksonville, Florida. At the moment, the UFC only seems to go to either the Apex, T-Mobile, somewhere in Texas, or Jacksonville. Uh, they, they went to California for the last pay-per-view, but a bit of a rarity. Anyway, that fight, that card has, it has two title fights. The featherweight title fight between Alexander Volkanovsky and the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung. And the bantamweight unification fight between champion Aljamain Sterling and real champion Piotr Jan. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I, I don't mean to I don't mean to demean Aljamain Sterling. I look, if you want my honest assessment of that, find the go into the archives if you're so inclined. You can look up my review of the event. Uh, UFC, what was it? Two fifty nine when they fought, and I stand by everything I said there. So, two title fights, darn good. Uh, funny story. Uh, apparently, Max Holloway got... The fight between uh, the zombie, Chan Sung Jung, stepped in after Holloway suffered some kind of an injury that disqualified him from the fight. Well, news came out last week that Max Holloway has now been medically cleared 
and he's just going to kind of train and weigh in as an alternate for the... So, <laughs> I don't know what injury he had that caused him to be pulled from this fight, and then, what, about a month later, three weeks? Uh, yeah, three or so weeks later, he's cleared to fight again. I, I don't know, but... Uh, if if something happens to either of those two guys and we get either of them versus Max Holloway, who's going to complain? Like, there's no permutation of those three guys fighting that is not interesting. Uh, so the rest of that card as it currently stands, uh, not bout order, but fights, uh, Jorginho Rosenstreich and Marcin Tabora, Irina Aldana and Aspen Ladd, Kelvin Gastelum and Nasruddin Imavov, that's a pretty good fight. Mackenzie Dern and Tisha Torres, Ian Gary and Darian Weeks, Gavin Tucker and Pat Sabatini. That's not bad either. Mickey Gall and Mike Malott. Um, Julio Arce and Daniel Santos. Mark Madsen and Vince Pichel. That could get... Hmm. I'm not going to say that's a, a fight that's going to attract a lot of people, but... That one has a bit of potential. Middleweight, Drikus Duplessis and Chris Curtis. That could be crazy. That's a pretty darn good fight, actually. Uh, women's strawweight, so Kay Hansen and Pierre Rodriguez. And then Anthony Hernandez and Albert Duraev. Uh, Anthony Hernandez and Albert Duraev, if I misspoke that to begin with. So, you've got two good title fights at the top of that. And you gotta, you could cobble together a strong pay-per-view card there. Uh... So 273, shaping up to be a solid night of fights, it looks like. I mean, you got some stuff there that, you know, is, is whatever, but at the moment, that's kind of par for the course. So, all right, that is it for the news. So I am going to check Twitter for breaking news. I'm also going to check the question tweet that I put out, as well as my Facebook post about the same, see if we have any questions that I could potentially answer here. If not, we are going to get into plugs and get out of here. Nope. All right, so plugs. Last week was kind of the usual spate of coverage. AEW's Dark Elevation on Monday. MLW, uh, yeah, MLW's Azteca series wrapped up on, miniseries wrapped up on Thursday. WWE SmackDown on Friday, and what a god-awful show that was. Then the UFC event on Saturday. Uh, more of the same this week, so my usual bit of professional wrestling coverage. Uh... They will all, if you're interested, in, and again, the UFC obviously on Saturday, if you're interested in my thoughts on things beyond mixed martial arts, uh, I do movie podcasts um, over for the W2M network. If you put Damn You Hollywood into whatever your search and into your podcast platform of choice happens to be, you'll probably find us. Uh, this week, myself and Mark Radulich will be reviewing Roland Emmerich's latest big budget disaster flick, both in that it is a movie about a disaster and... It's kind of a disaster. <laughs> uh, Moonfall. So, he and I will talk about that, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the box office, and I will make him give me kudos for correctly predicting that Jackass forever would win the box office this weekend when he thought I was, uh... He thought I was nuts to have potential to have predicted that, but... Well, who was... Now that the returns are in, who's laughing now? So you can be on the lookout for that. Uh, I think that's the only other podcast I am doing this week. I think I'm doing this one. No, that triple feature is not me. That's very much not me. Uh, yeah, that's it. So that will be my other podcast for the week. Uh, next week will be the double feature of Big Bug and Kimmy. That ought to be interesting. All right, so that's it for me. Thank you all very, very much for listening. I deeply appreciate it. Once again, give a like, comment, subscription, star rating, written review, and a share, if at all possible. If not, well, I just appreciate that you listen. So on that note, thanks again. Per usual, stay safe out there and continue to be well, be safe, and behave. <laughs>